All right, cool. So let's uh, get into the lesson. So the lesson is going to be focusing on how to choose the right opening for you. Uh, but before we get into the notes that I have, let me find out from uh, Musweli. Uh, I have to see your name written down. If I see it written down, then I say it easily. But uh, it, uh, I, I take a bit of time with names, but please forgive me. Uh, but yeah, uh, let, what, do, what do you think is the best way to choose an opening? Um, for me, personally, I just think it's dependent on what you feel most comfortable playing. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, whatever you feel more comfortable playing around because different people feel comfortable playing in different positions. So whatever All position right. you feel, yeah, you feel comfortable playing and then choose the opening that lands you in that position. So yeah, that's, that, I just think that's how it goes. All right, no, that's a very good answer. Thank you. Uh, Tivek? What do you think is the is the best way to choose an opening? The um the best way to cho choose an opening is um to uh, to learn like every opening and to learn like uh, what's like how you play it and uh, everything about that opening and and see which one you like the best. Okay, see which opening you like the best. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Uh, Tristan, welcome. There we go. Yeah, Mulweli. Is that the way I say it? Mu it's Mulweli. Mulweli. Yeah. Mulweli. Mulweli. Yeah. Okay. Lue. Yeah. Okay. Good. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah. But now I think it's there, and I see it also. I'd gone to the Google form to double check the the name. Now at least you also help by sending it there. Mulweli. All right. Good. Tristan, welcome. Tristan. Hi, Tristan. Okay, so you just caught us when we were about to start. We had to do just some puzzles before we could start. Uh, we're waiting for you to come. But now that you are here, I did something with everyone. I don't know if you can see the messages in the chat. Can you see the messages, Tristan? No. Oh, okay, so let me send this. So all three of us did this. So I would like to ask you to do it before we start so that ah, I'm sending it to, to direct message. Sorry. Yeah, it must come to everyone. Okay, so Tristan, now you should be able to see it. So basically, I asked these four questions and all three of us answered. I was the first one to go, but now you can also go so that we could we can meet you and know a little bit about you. And then we can start. By the way, the favorite color, it's not about what color do you like to play with? It's just what is your favorite color in general? Okay. So when you are ready, you can answer those questions. Tristan, can you hear me? Yes, I'm quickly answering the questions. Oh, no, no, you must say it out loud. There are these ones you don't have to type in chat. You can just answer them online. Oh, um, my name is Tristan Yonkers. I've been playing chess for eight years. And my favorite chess player is obviously Magnus Carlsen. <laughs> my favorite color is orange. All right, wonderful. Thanks, Tristan. Good to meet you. Okay, great. So now, guys, let's begin. Let's hit the, uh, the ground running. Uh, we, and I just asked the question, what do you think is the best way to choose an opening? So Tivek and Mulweli answered that. Uh, Mulweli said that it's what you feel comfortable with. The opening that, feel, that you feel comfortable with, the position you are comfortable to play, and Tivek said maybe the position that gives you the best chance to learn. Uh, what do you think, Tristan? For you, this is your personal opinion. What do you think is the best way to choose an opening? Um, it depends on your playing style, but yeah, whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, your opinion is, is valued a lot. That's why I'm asking you these questions. Um, 
So let us jump into the presentation that I have uh, for us. Uh, let's just make sure it will take us here. Good. Um, share portion of the screen. All right. So let's go full screen. Or is it this one? All right, so basically, uh, how to play good chess openings. I once did this as a PowerPoint presentation. We'll use some of the notes from here and I'll edit some new notes that I have learned in the years that have passed. Um, well, okay. As you can see, this was primarily to stress on the fact of good openings, but in general, no opening wins or loses. I only learned this recently. <laughs> I, I, I hadn't learned it then, but of course I, I had an idea of it. But basically there are openings that are agreed by many uh, strong grandmasters that these are the best openings. And there are also some openings that are said by many strong grandmasters that these are bad openings. And some openings have actually been refuted. So refuted means the opening has actually been proven by just straight tactics that this opening loses if you play it. Uh, but yeah, okay. The way you play in the opening has a big impact on the middle game. So this is the first point about the opening. The opening is not the end itself. The opening is a way to the end game. Or, uh, it's the road to the middle game and to the end game eventually. So that is really what the opening counts for mostly. No opening wins, no opening loses. Any other opinion about openings is usually harmful to the development of chess players. So if you play a bad opening, you the a bad opening is usually going to allow tactics to happen. It, it's just not it just moves that allow for tactics to happen. I'll show some examples. So if you play a bad opening and if you lose a piece or a pawn, you have a bad middle game and end game. The game might not lose right away in the opening because normally no one really loses in the opening unless you blunder checkmate, of course. That would really be a huge mistake. But in general, you can play very bad moves in the opening and still go on to the middle game and maybe even the end game. And you might be even surprised that you even win or draw the game that you were apparently losing from the opening. Now, of course, understanding the opening can help you to avoid time trouble. When you have studied and understand your openings, you don't waste time thinking on every move in the opening, which a lot of players, when they are told by their chess coaches or by some chess players they respect a lot, you must use your time. They think using your time means just letting your time run, uh, run down. <laughs> that's not using your time. That's actually misusing your time, if anything. Yeah, using your time means you use your time to think when you need to think. Um, but if you already know the position and you've practiced it, you don't have to pretend like you're thinking and just letting your time go down. Uh, of course, you can avoid opening traps to play good openings. You must study all the traps that happen in the openings you play. Um, and how do you play good chess openings? Of course, we all know this. We'll make a summary of this and then we'll get into some pictures. Develop your pieces. This is your number one goal in the opening. The opening is a preparation stage. It is a mistake to start attacking in the opening. Normally, if you start attacking in the opening, it's a mistake because you don't have enough pieces to attack with. Usually you need, if you want your attack to be successful, you must always attack with more pieces uh, than the opponent can find defenders. So in his famous book, The Great Chess Player of the Past, uh, Ruben, no, no, it's not Rubenstein. Was it Rubenstein? It is Rubenstein. Uh, in the ideas behind chess openings, he writes there are two important things in every opening that you see. And these are the first two, developing of your pieces and control of the center. There is nothing more important than these two things. Every move that is played in the opening is judged by these two things mainly. King safety fits in there 
just because it is important in every part of the game. King safety is important in the opening. King safety is important in the middle game. King safety is important in the end game. It's the most important topic in, the, in all of chess. If your king is not safe, you are going to be in trouble. Control the center. By pushing your central pawns, you allow your pieces to develop. Yeah, this should be uh, to be developed quickly and you also control space advantage. That's why uh, the center is so important. King safety, this is the most important thing. In the opening, mid game and end game, just what I said. Castle your king early, a, a castled king. This is what a, a lot of players don't understand this actually. They think that if I castle my king will be an easy target, but that's wrong thinking. It's, uh, it's, it's been proven in practice, that means real chess games. It's much more difficult to attack a king when it's castled than to attack it when it's in the center. Castling your king also activates your, <laughs> your castle, the play on words, your rook. Play openings that fit your style of play. So this is the number one uh, point when you are choosing an opening that is right for you. And notice I'm saying the opening must be right for you. I'm not saying the opening must be right for me. The opening must be right for Magnus Carlsen. The opening must be right for your chess coach. The opening must be right for whoever. The opening must be right for you, the individual. It must be right for you, Tivek, uh, oh. Uh, Musloeli, Mulweli. Sorry, I tried to say it all at once. That's why it doesn't come out right. Mulweli and Tristan. Uh, the opening must be right for you as an individual. Right. It's not about what I think or what anyone else thinks. You must decide what opening you want to play. Because in the end, you are the player. I cannot play chess for you. Even though sometimes I want to play for you, but I'm not allowed by the rules, <laughs> right? You, you, you must play your own chess. So you need to find your chess voice when you play an opening. It must be right for you. Personally, you must like it and you must enjoy it. You must be comfortable with the position. If you are an attacking player, it makes no sense to play passive opening. For example, if you like to attack like Mikhail Tao and you like to uh, be aggressive like Gere Kasparov, what business do you have playing an opening like the Karo Khan, for, for example? Right? Especially the Dao versions of the Karo Khan. I know, of course, there can be some very sharp lines in the Karo Khan, but you don't always get those ones. Mostly you get the very quiet lines that don't allow you to do anything fun and exciting. You must play a very long, slow game. It will make no sense. Just from that, because the opening depends a lot on your feelings. Unlike these are the two parts of the game, middle game and end game, the opening is the one stage of the chess game that depends, if not purely, on your feelings. If you feel good about the position, you can play it, no matter what the grandmaster say or what even, even the engine says. And I'll prove some of these things to us. For now, it's just words, so you, you are not really believing me right now. Okay, so generally, when you have decided on the opening you want to play, you want to at least practice a habit of finding games on the opening you want to play. And I'll show you how to do that. I'll explain the process. So in this lesson, you're going to get a lot of practical tools. So if you uh, participate and you put them to use, this lesson will be very useful for you. Uh, so I'll show you how to do something like this. Find 30 to 100 games, but at the minimum, at least 20 games in each of the main lines of the opening or variations of your openings, played by grandmasters, of course. Play through them quickly the first time. You don't really have to analyze every move and try to remember every move. Just play through them. You are, for now, you just want to see. Then try to learn the ideas and strategies they use in these openings, and especially the typical plans that they follow in the middle game and what possible end games actually can come uh, from from that opening. And then if you really want to be a master, take those set of games and find at least two to three games that really excited you. Like it made you come alive. You were so interested in the opening after you saw these games that those two, three games, or it could even be one, you don't have to start with two or three. You can, you can have just the one game that was amazing for you. You can commit that to memory so that you always have a reference point. Like, for example, let me ask a question. What other sports do we play here uh, besides chess? 
do any of you play any other sports besides chess? I play football. Okay. Tivek, do you play any other sports besides chess? Soccer. Soccer, okay. Tristan? No, I just play chess. I don't play other sports. Okay, but do you watch any other sport? Um, occasionally rugby. Okay, all right. All right, so, okay, or at least you guys have some understanding on, on, on or watching or playing other sports. So generally, like, for example, for soccer players, people will talk about Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi, right, uh, or Neymar da Silva or Kylian Mbappe, all these guys. Uh, so these are the big soccer guys, Kevin De Bruyne and all of that. So these are like people that can be used as role models. If you are a soccer player, you want to see what can I learn from this guy that I can also try. I cannot be like Kevin De Bruyne. I cannot be like Cristiano Ronaldo. In impossible. There's only one you, and there's only one Cristiano Ronaldo. But there is, of course, some things that are good that Ronaldo or Messi does that you also can try to use in your own game. So the same thing in chess and the same thing in rugby. If I want to be as good as, uh, I don't know, who is so good at the moment? I don't really follow rugby too much these days. But from the Springbok, say... Um, Villeroux, you know, the nice fullback. He can play also in the back line. What a complete player, right? He can run and carry the ball. He can sidestep. He can do all these nice things. So you also want to learn some things from this guy uh, and, and, and so forth. So the same thing in chess. If you will find an opening that excites you, find at least two to three games. It's easy to commit something to memory when you like it. They actually do it in science, apparently. The more feelings that something gives you, the easy it is to remember it. So if you like have, have good feelings about something, you can remember it in the long-term memory. So it, it would be very easy. Find games by two strong grandmasters that show fighting play by both sides. It wasn't like one-sided. At least there was some excitement. The, the other, they, they both really had to show good chess so that it gives you a reference of how the opening is played and how it can go to the middle game and end game. Remember the most important thing. The opening is a way to get to the end game. The opening is not how you win chess. If you go around hoping to win chess in the opening, you are going to be disappointed more times than not. I know, of course, in the culture that we have these days, a lot of it is all these YouTube videos, how to destroy the Sicilian defense, how to checkmate your opponent in the Karakan, and all these things. For personally, because, you know, uh, I, Elite Chess also has a YouTube channel. Most of it is just marketing. People, uh, chess coaches and chess companies know that a lot of the masses, a lot of the guys that watch YouTube videos are interested in openings because openings are fun, openings are exciting, and you can surprise your opponent. So they use openings as a way to market because what do they usually do in those lessons? At the end, they are going to be selling you some course, right? Not that so much they will find, there is no one opening that destroys all, you know, one opening to rule them all. Impossible. There is no such thing because in the end, uh, no opening wins, no opening loses. It's just marketing. Anything else is really marketing uh, or it will just be bad for your development. Uh, but we, you must at least have some ideas of what is a good chess opening. We've already said it, it's just to remember the same things again. Uh, the characteristics of a good opening, you finish the development of all your pieces quickly. You control and fight for the center. Your king is safely castled away. Your rooks are connected. You don't have a lot of pawn moves that don't help you develop your pieces or control the center. And especially, you don't have structural weaknesses. You don't create double pawns for no reason. And you don't create isolated pawns for no reason. Because uh, creating pawn weaknesses can have big effect in how you play the middle game and the end game. Uh, now, of course, this is nothing to do with the lesson. I think the presentation is finished. We can move on now to other things that I'll add as we will do a practical <laughs> as we we'll do a practical application. So before we do that, let me find out, what have you learned from that presentation? Or have you learned anything? <laughs>
actually. That's also a, 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 another way to answer the, ask the question. Um, that no opening is, no opening means an opening. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Tristan. Um, for me, yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. Like, just knowing that no opening loses and no opening wins. It's more of how you play through it after that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Molweli. Okay, so Tivek, I assume the silence, you, you didn't learn anything or... No, I learned the same thing. Oh, okay, cool. All right, cool. Yeah, now I, I try to keep it fun. So please have, uh, pardon my jokes. I try to, to be a bit, because uh, if it's also too serious, you don't really remember any of the things. So when it's fun, it's easy for you to remember the stuff. Well, at least I hope it's funny. But even it not being funny will still help you to remember it. Because like, ah, that guy had so many bad jokes. Uh, so it will still help you to remember some, some of the things we were doing. Um, because that's the goal for me. I, my goal is that you will live in this lesson having remembered some things and you are going to be using what you have learned. That's really the, my why for coaching or doing uh, chess. I want you to remember the lessons and I want you to use it in your own chess journey. That's the, the most important thing for me, um, for your chess development. Okay, cool. So I'm going to, to prove some of these things now. Because up until now, I've just been talking a bunch of words and words don't correct anyone usually. So let me show you about this statement I made. So this is really my biggest statement that I want you to get out of this. No opening wins, no opening loses. That's the first and most important thing. And what you guys had, you already said this, you should feel comfortable with the opening. Number two, you should learn from the opening. And it must suit your playing style. So this is what you guys knew before the lesson. And now we are going to get into uh, some bullet points on this point. But let's first look at some examples. On this point, no opening wins, no opening loses. Queen h5, we all know that this is a, a bad move, right? But I want to shock us a little bit. Do you think that this opening can be played at 2700 level? Or can be seen in a 2700 game level? Especially in recent chess memory. Do you think that a strong grandmaster could play this more? Anyone? Um, no. Okay. Or let me shock you. So let's go to the opening. Tivek, go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, some strong grandmasters uh, can play this opening. Yeah, they can, and not just any. Look at this. This game happened in 2019. And surprise, surprise, who is on the white side of the board? The world chess champion himself, Magnus Carlsen. Not just playing it like an 800. He's not playing an 800 player. Does it say here 600 rated player? Or it says a 1000 rated player or some 1500 rated player? Or even an 1800 player or 2000 rated player? No, it says 2763. These uh, boys, these are what are called super grandmasters. This is a very small group of people in the world, as I'll show you now. I think it's less than less than 40 for sure in the world. As you can see here, 
There are only 39 people in the world right now who, are, who have the privilege to be called Super Grandmasters. The title is so uh, prestigious, it's not given by the FIDE. The title is given by people. Human beings give this title to, to the players, you know? So that shows how prestigious it is. Super GM is a title that you only get from people. They recognize that you are now on another level. To become 27 other plus is not a joke. Uh, so this would already shock us because how can the world champion then? And this wasn't any like a blitz game or rapid game. This was a classical chess game, if I remember correctly. And it took, it took the whole world by surprise. Magnus Carlsen here was ranked, uh, was rated 2,882. This is only seven points lower than his highest ever rating, which is 2,889. So we cannot say Magnus was tilted. He wasn't playing at his best. He had maybe lost 70 rating points and now he was just doing some foolish nonsense. This is him seven points away from his prime. And by the way, this 2889 is the highest rated, uh, is the highest rating recorded in the history of chess. So he's almost at that uh, peak level. And he plays this very rubbish chess opening. Now, many people would say he, he deserves to lose, you know. Uh, but he went on, the game was played. One really look at the game, it's not interesting. Uh, and the game continued. He even had an advantage at some point. Uh, could even have won the game. Um, but it went into some end game and they played some bishop end game where he tried to, to win because he always tries to win. He tried, he tried, he tried, he tried until, of course, his opponent is also good. They made some draw. Um, right, so let's get your thoughts. What do you think about this? I mean, they played a lot of moves. As I said, the guy will keep trying to win. Uh, but now it's just a draw. The computer already... Uh, uh, shows that it's zero zero. What do you think of this first example? As a way for me to defend my claim that no opening wins, no opening loses. <laughs> As you can see, some of the comments. Yeah, is this a joke? <laughs> Carlson tried a scholar mate uh, against 27, 27, 63 feet, you know, and all of that. So what do we think of the first example? Anyone? Uh, have I left everyone speechless? Yeah, of course he has done it a few times. Uh, of course he has lost uh, when he, at one point in 2018, he even lost with 2400 when he tried to play the Patsa opening. Uh, he, the one who was very popular for playing it is Hikaru Nakamura. He actually, in the database, he is the one strong grandmaster that used this opening quite a lot um, at some point in his career. He was famous for doing this. So, uh, yeah, what are, what are our thoughts about this, this first point? No one has anything to say. Yeah, that's also fine. So let's continue with uh, the lesson and then I'll start to show some, some examples now uh, that are a little bit more, more serious. Uh, but that one is a very important one. Why do you think I would share something like that? It is to help you guys to be free from this fear of playing a bad opening or an opening that computer says is losing or an opening that a grandmaster says is losing. No one cares about the opinion of the computer or the grandmaster about the opening. If you like the opening, if it is your opening, play it, but just do it properly, of course. That's what I want to teach you. Right. But don't care what anyone says about the opening. If you are happy with the opening and you enjoy playing the opening, then play it. Because as we can see from that evidence, uh, no opening wins, no opening loses. If, a, if the, the world chess champion, and he was world champion then already 2019, he decides to play such an opening and gets away with it. I mean, even recently, he did something even more shocking. You know, 
in a of course at least this was a rapid online event but still he's playing against a strong player he decides to start the game by playing f3 and then uh, the the commentator from chess 24 the very strong grandmaster peter leko cries out magnus deserves to lose for starting with this move f3 i think he even won that game if i'm not mistaken um and then of course he played a4 in a blitz game in a real blitz game against the wesley so this was at the norway chess tournament i think to decide well, the colors the players were going to play with. So clearly, even though it was a blitz game, but there were important blitz games because this would determine how many white uh, pieces he plays within the tournament and how many black pieces he plays with. For grandmasters, these things matter a lot, especially the amount of white pieces you can play with. Uh, he started this move uh, against a, again, a, a top 10 player even. So I think I rest my case. Let's let's uh, let's progress to some of the points. Your opening choice should be based on your goals. Your goals in chess. Some of this material I credit uh, the very strong international master Anna Rudolf. I actually had a video on. And choosing your opening is one of the best I've seen. And some of these points now that I'm adding to those previous ones in the PowerPoint, I learned from her. And she's the one actually where I learned this point, the point number two. Your opening choice should be based on your goals in chess. If you have a goal to become a 2000 rated player, why are you playing such drawish openings if you are still rated 1200? It makes no sense, does it? Because if you are playing openings that if everyone knows to play the right things, the games end more as draws than they can end as wins. Then you might need to change your opening. You see what I'm saying? So this is a, so for you, if you have a pen and a paper, I'll, if you don't, I would encourage that you'd get one. Write down, what is my goal in chess? This must help you to choose an opening. There's thousands of chess openings. There's a lot of them. But you must choose at least an opening that, number one, this must be the first point to help you to be free to choose. No opening wins, no opening loses. You can choose any opening. You can even choose what is called the grob opening. I was showing this to a student yesterday and she was laughing. She thought, I mean, there's an opening called the grob opening and it starts with the G pawn. Uh, and she, if in her mind, this is just a bad opening, right? Uh, but if someone wants to play this, and I even know a, a chess friend who plays this quite a lot uh, at club level, uh, even with mixed results, of course, but they enjoy it. It's, it's part of their style. They enjoy it. They play it. So no opening wins or loses. Your opening choice should be based on your goals in chess. On the point that you, got, you all understood, your opening should fit your style we'll spend a bit of time here on this point because this is if you can get this then it will make sense so i want to now find out um tristan what would you say is your style of play in chess or do you know your style of play in chess um i honestly like on the defending side Okay. All right. Mulwelly. Uh well, I'm not sure if it, it's a style, but I'm more of like a full attack type of player. Like, uh -huh. yeah, from the onset, I just go for attack. I I I I believe attack is the best defense. So yeah, okay. that's that's kind of how I play. All right, cool. And Tivek. Yeah, also attacking. All right. So from there, I can maybe give you some generalized styles, right? So the general styles that are there is again general because style is very broad. But from what you have said, I can say the two players are aggressive chess players. 
mean place to checkmate, basically. Place to checkmate. Everything else takes a big seat. And Tristan would be, say, passive player. Plays to, to defend the opponents. Yeah, mostly. Not only because sometimes a passive player can attack, but this is gen uh, this, this is a general term. You might be uh, there is also a positional player. There is a dynamic player. Um, defensive player. And tactical player, strategical player, ETC. The list can go on and on and on and on. So the reason why it is important for me to discuss this is so that you know how to identify your style, right? So there are at least a few things. Again, I hope you have a pen and a paper that you can use to identify what style you like to play. Firstly, the main, the one of the ways to tell what style you, uh, you like to play is what feelings do you get when you play uh, certain positions? If you play a position that has an open center like this, um, and this, Uh, okay, can't really remember the moves now, but I think it's this, and then it's that, and then it's maybe here, and so forth. The center isn't yet quite open because we need to get rid of these two pawns, but for the most part, in an open center, it literally means there are no pawns on the central files. It's wide open, and usually the play is very tactical. Uh, when the center is open, because they are open lines, no open line, no attack. You can't attack without open lines. So if we have two open lines and the center is wide open, the bishop is piercing from the queen side to the king side, this, this position will be a very aggressive position. One way to get an open center is through here. We can go there, the opponent will move somewhere. Uh, let's say, I don't know, maybe d5 wanting to go there and after some move like this there's some c6 move i'll just make some bad moves so we can get an open center and now we officially have a center that is open right and somehow black would castle so let's say black castles because they can sacrifice the pawn it's not going to be running away anytime soon white castles um wide castles and then we have a situation now where the center is wide open now if you are happy with this position and you are like a dog that is uh, with its head outside the the car in the road like enjoying the the fresh breeze then this would probably put you in this category you are a tactical player and an aggressive chess player what is the difference between an aggressive chess player and a tactical player? An aggressive chess player, uh, an aggressive chess player has nothing else they care more about than to checkmate the opponent's king. But a tactical player is not just focused on checkmating the opponent. A tactical player would like to find tactics to win material, and of course, if checkmate should come up, they'll win through checkmate. But it's mostly to find tactics to win material and uh, eventually checkmate. But an aggressive player doesn't care. They want to checkmate. An aggressive player plays like this, for example. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4 takes, bishop to d6, knight f6, castles. Let's go for your king. Take here, and then I, I, I'm going to get at you. You know? I mean, it's just mad, 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 mad chess, you know? 
tactics are all over the place, but their goal is to get to that king somehow. This is someone who is an aggressive player. And then you get some players who are more positional. So they'll start, especially the famous uh, former world champion, Vladimir Kramnik, who would like to play the Reggie system. Basically doesn't care too much about what Black is doing. He just makes his moves and prepares his position. And then he tries to start hitting the opponent's weaknesses. So positional chess focuses more on gaining small advantages, controlling the center, development, controlling an open diagonal, controlling a file, attacking weak squares, attacking weak pawns, very positional. Right. A dynamic player is a player who likes to play positions that have material imbalances mostly. Like for example, this can be a picture of a dynamic player. E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight to C6, Bishop to C4, Knight here, Knight there, uh, takes and no, this, such kind of chess is very dynamic and very imbalanced. And even Bishop D3 is now the popular move these days. And you know, okay, here there is a there, there is a pawn down, but Blank has very clear counterplay. Black has easy development for their pieces. Right. That's, that is an example of dynamic chess. You're not afraid to give away material, so long as the material will give you something in return. Either development or, because now white has a, this is the best move according to the engine and to theory these days, but this actually violates strategy. Strategy normally says, don't put the bishop in front of your central pawns because the deep pawn can't move out so that this bishop can be developed. But white is holding on to the material and wants black to prove that this gambit works. So this could be more a dynamic uh, chess. And what else? Even? So passive player. Pl passive player, if they are attacked, they just usually defend. Like they don't really try to find any counter attacking move. They just look to defend the whole time. Uh, and they and they are not afraid. It's like playing like this. The famous hippo opening. Uh, so basically something like this. And then white brings. So black is playing a very passive position. Passive normally means your pieces are aren't even going past you mostly rank seven and eight. If your pieces are mostly found on rank seven and eight, your position is passive because most of the pieces aren't focused on attacking the opponent side of the board. So that's what space advantage is all about. And in chess, space advantage is one of the most important advantages. If you cannot get space, if you cannot get space advantage on how to attack the opponent side of the board, then your position is pretty passive. Uh, and then a defensive player. A defensive player is mostly concerned about stopping the opponent's plans, the opponent's threats. But of course, a defensive player can find even some exciting ways to defend. They don't normally play with like an idea. Their idea is to stop the opponent's plan. You know, it's, it's like it's been said. If you don't know how to play, if you don't have a plan, that's fine. Try to stop your opponent's plan. So that's mainly like maybe what could be called a defensive player in, in some way. And of course, some of these things you can check me. I'm not saying I'm right on all of these things, but from, in my opinion, this is what I have understood and also what I've heard from other players. But for sure, the information can always be added or removed. Uh, but yeah, so I don't know. Is there any comments about the distinction of style of play and so forth? Do you at least understand that a little bit on how to determine your style of play? Because you hear it a lot. You must play an opening that suits your style. But how do I even know what is my style? Does it make sense? Yes, it makes sense for me. OK, cool. Right. Uh, so you, your opening should fit your style of play the positions you feel good about. Uh, even sometimes uh, a position normally that the pawn structure, the way that they are set up is, is the way you, you, know, you know the general plans. You just agree with them. Like for example, 
I just love this English opening. I don't know why, but I just love it. I don't really know too much the theory in it, but I just love the opening because when I understand the plan of the position, I just basically play the position without too much thought. And I win a lot of games against even strong players with this opening because many players hate this opening, especially when they play black. It's very difficult to find an aggressive way to win against uh, the English opening. It's so annoying for most players. Not that the opening is a super opening, that it destroys every opening. No, it just means it, it doesn't agree with many people's style. Like for players who like to play Kings Indian, they are very annoyed that black, white, they won't be able to get their king side attack that they usually want to get because of white strong bishop here and strong fight for the center. So this plan for them that, that they will put their knight here, start pushing all these pawns, won't really work in this position. So it, it doesn't go to, uh, according to their style and their feelings, they don't really feel good about the position. Okay, let me just give, because uh, this is a long lesson, of course. I was a bit ambitious trying to do it in only one, uh, in one lesson, but okay, sure. At least you have a foundation after this. You can't all learn it in, in one day. Um, so no opening wins, no opening loses. Your opening choice should be based on your goals in chess. Your opening should fit your style. And what is the most important thing that I'm missing out here? Choosing out your opening. Yeah, for now, I think it's fine. Let's leave it here in case the other thing comes back to mind. I think there's one more thing I wanted to show, but if I remember it, I'll show it. But now let's make it practical. Let's start looking at some examples. Um, so when you have found this opening of yours, a very cool website, I'll send the name to you in chat that you can look at after this. This is an amazing chess website. I was so happy to, to, to find them. If you can find the opening that you like, the next step is to get games on that opening. Like for example, I like to play G6, the modern defense. It's an opening that many people say is very dubious, if not even a bad opening, but I like the opening. So what do I do? I find games on the opening. And if you have chess base reader or chess base, you can even change the setup like ELO. You want to usually look at games played by 25, okay, usually even 2600 and above, because these are the players that really, so actually ELO black, since I'm looking at an opening from the black side, so that I can really learn from the best players. So we can take example, a game by Kasparov. So this is now that point I was mentioning on the on this uh, PowerPoint. Find games. So the way to find games, you can go on PGN Mentors. You download games on the opening that you play, right? Um, and now you go and start viewing this game. We see here Kasparov played G6. But it turns out more into a King's Indian defense more than it is G6, but it did start with G6. But the ideas are completely uh, normal, even in a G6 opening. So I'm just playing the opening. I'm just trying to see basically what happens. And I can see quite a lot of uh, sharp tactical play, very dynamic, very attacking. And in the end, it even uh, finished with the checkmate somehow. So I wasn't really paying too much attention to every move. I'm just trying to feel the position. Uh, we can look at an example by uh, Dimitri and Reikin. Similar opening. Uh, a lot of f5 pushes seem to happen. And the bishop usually changes his diagonal and so forth. And we see here the white had to resign. There's a mate on g2 that can't be stopped. Uh, game over. Or sacrifice the knight. So you start to get familiar with the opening, basically. Because that's the best way to learn. We usually, we as people, learn by example.
Okay, sorry about that. Can you guys hear me again? My speaker, I was moving about, so the speaker went out. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yeah, so I've been talking a whole bunch. I don't know if I'm making a lot of sense. You guys are all quiet now. So let me find out. Is this making any sense uh, or am I confusing you guys with all the things I'm saying? No, it's making sense. All right, good. So for the last 20 minutes of the lesson, let's make um, some practical examples on uh, on chess openings. So the best tournament normally to follow for good chess openings is the World Championship. And the second best is the Candidates Tournament. So we are going to look at some examples of um, of games that were, were played in one of the most famous chess tournaments in the history of chess, the Zurich 1953 Candidates Chess Tournament. They even wrote a whole book about this tournament. And Fabiano Caruana, this is his favorite book. Uh, so we'll see usually the best preparation will come out from these kinds of openings. Let's quickly check it out and see what we can find out. So we are more or less going to focus mainly on the openings, the games, we won't really look at all the games. So the game here was played by Yuri Avebak uh, versus Max Eva. Quick history lesson. Yuri Avebak is the oldest grandmaster in the history of chess. He just, unfortunately, he died this year, earlier in the year. Uh, but he was 100 years old, if I'm not mistaken, or 99 years old. He was the oldest living grandmaster and the oldest in the history of chess. He is uh, one of the most important chess uh, players in the history of chess. His literature, his development of chess. And here he plays again uh, against a former world champion, Max Eva, and a former FIDE president. So very important players in this game. So D4 was selected in this tournament. It was one of the most popular openings in this tournament and especially the Nimzo Indian. So the Nimzo Indian for black is, is considered one of the most solid ways for black to play against D4 because black doesn't allow white to have many targets or weaknesses to attack. So let us see what preparation uh, Yuri Avebach uh, came up with. So here he just plays very solid moves, uh, the E3 line. Uh, and just develop species, castles, castles, A3 takes. Now, you could say, wasn't this guy saying I mustn't double my pawns? Now, you must be very careful. In chess, the words mustn't, shouldn't, can't, won't are very dangerous, unless it is breaking the rules of chess. Like, you should never move your queen like a knight. This I can say with confidence. But if you notice the words I use when I give this, Try, right? Try not to weaken your. I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I'm not the only one, but I can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, I, I did hear the, the 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 disconnection from the from the mic. But now you should be hearing me now again, yeah? Okay, good. So there's a lot of exceptions in chess. So these things of must, can't, won't, shouldn't, must be very, you must be very wary of those things. I never tell you that you must not have double pawns. Try not to have double pawns. If there's a good reason for it, you can have double pawns. So in this opening, especially the Nimzo Indian opening, the reason Black brings out this bishop here, has a, he, Black has a plan to capture on c3 and double white's pawn. So Black is giving up the two bishop advantage by for the uh, in return to double up white's two pawns and also uh, to have a target on c4. But White says that's fine. I'll take the double pawns, but I'll take the, the two bishop advantage. So in chess, it's a give and take type of thing. And of course, white can always get rid of these double pawns by taking on d5. And black even did it for white. So it takes, and now white maintains the two bishop advantage. Black is going to play to attack the center. 
White develops a piece and defending the threat of e4 that was threatened. Queen e7, e4 still threatened. Now white has to take. So white remains with a double pawn. But white, no, with an isolated pawn. Two isolated pawns, actually. But for his weaknesses, white has two pieces that are very important. The two bishop advantage. Rook to e1 and all of that. So the opening is almost more or less over. We stop here. When the rooks are connected, usually we know that the opening is finished. So we can take count. For what has white got out of this opening? White has managed to get two bishops in this opening, but he did allow structural weaknesses, which is one of the points to try to avoid when you choose an opening. Try to avoid an opening that will give you weaknesses for no reason. So here he did get weaknesses, but there is a good reason for it. He has the two bishops that he has for that weakness. And the pawn can always be pushed to c4, opening up a diagonal. And um, white will have an attack against the king. Maybe for the sake of completion, I'll just play through the rest of the most quickly. So uh, we'll see why uh, black managed to, to get a very active position, even winning back the bishop. If anything, uh, the game almost looked like it was losing for white at some point, but in the end, even though this pawn was a weakness in the end in the opening, now it's a huge advantage in the end game. <laughs> Maybe this is a good example to show what would have been a weakness in the opening in the middle game now is a huge advantage, huge, massive. Why? Because it is now in the end game. It's called what do we call this kind of pawn in the end game? Who knows? What is the name of the pawn here? Is it like a pass pawn? It is a pass pawn, uh, but it's also called an outside passed pawn. The outside pass pawn is the pawn that is on the edge of the board. It's the most dangerous pass pawn to have because it is far away from the opponent's king usually and the pieces. So it drags away these pieces to the side of the board. And th for this reason, white went on to win the game. Uh, the pass pawn is keeping the black rook stuck here. And now you see even the king had to come all the way there to stop this pawn. We'll just see uh, he resigned after this uh, because he's going to lose these pawns. Uh, he, he had seen enough. Okay, so that's the first example. Let's uh, go to the next game. Look at again another game of uh, Yuri Vich, uh, Yuri Averbach. Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. So this time he, play, he decides to play e4. So we have the Sicilian defense. And funny enough, the player playing with the black pieces, the opening is named after him. Uh, this is called the Sicilian Taimano variation. So Taimanov is the one who's playing the Taimano variation. In case you don't know, that's how many openings have names. The name of the player the, who played the opening or the name of the group of people like the English uh, for people in England or the French for the French, the people in France or some country that it was played in or some city and so forth. That's how many chess openings have names. Um, so here we see a very uh, popular opening very dangerous of course so this opening uh is mostly a dynamic opening so you can't play this kind of opening as white if you like to play passive chess because uh it, it's not going to happen uh, uh well it won't be very good for you because you have to be dealing with a lot of problems the whole time 
Black is always going to be threatening this e pawn when this bishop comes to b7, and b4 will be, will be threatened to get rid of this knight. So white has to play with energy. So for someone who doesn't like to play like this, maybe choosing another opening against the Sicilian would be better if the opponent, so especially the open Sicilian, which has d4. This is called the open Sicilian. Choosing this opening would be bad news if you don't like to, to play sharp or dynamic positions. So after knight c6, I usually play bishop b5, which is the popular opening these days. It's called the Rosolimo. It's a very solid opening. This one suits more to positional players. Players who like to play slow chess, who like to plan and not have to think of tactics right from the beginning. So uh, either back, of course, there's no problem like that. He's a dynamic player and already there are threats everywhere. The rook is hanging. The bishop comes in. So you, it will be a bad idea to choose this opening if you don't like to play this kind of chess. Where, especially the Sicilian. The Sicilian is the most popular opening at the highest level of chess because it's very confrontational. Uh, black is always trying to force white to do something, which with many defensive, uh, with many defenses, black doesn't always get that option. But the Sicilian is one such opening. So white has to play with energy. Takes, takes, knight h5. There's been threats from the beginning. The king hasn't even castled, and it's already so uh, aggressive. And there's a pawn that has been taken. So white sacrifices a pawn. We know this is a candidate's tournament. So the guy is not going to blunder a pawn. This is all preparation. He has prepared to give away a pawn. For what? Can you explain why white has given up a pawn? What is the reason for this, the, the gambiting of the pawn? Yeah, you can unmute if you have something to share about that. Why has white sacrificed the pawn in the opening? Okay, come on, guys. I need you to participate. It's not, uh, I can't be talking the whole time. I'm waiting for someone to explain why the pawn was sacrificed. Um, I I personally think it gives him a better yeah, I position. I can't hear you, um, Mulweli. Um, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Say it's you are unmuted, so I don't know if you are speaking. I am, but uh or oh, you can't hear me. Oh, okay, no, my mic is working. Yeah, there is no sound. Or maybe if you don't want to say something, you can type a message, but yeah, please, you need to participate. The only way these things will get into your head is if you actually participate. If you just sit there as a passive listener, the information won't uh, won't help you whatsoever. Um, can you hear me now? So Tristan, why do you think he has sacrificed the pawn? Why is white sacrificed the pawn? Personally, um, Dion, I do not know. I'm still figuring that out. I'm also not hearing you. I don't know. It, it must. It might be me. Okay. I know. Yeah. Okay. So Mulweli said it gives White a better attacking position. Tristan, I couldn't hear you. I don't know if your mic also is not working, or maybe it's my headphones who are not, which are not working. Because I just checked there. It says they are connected. So. Yeah, okay. Okay, so and he has sacrificed a pawn in score, uh, He has sacrificed a pawn to get counterplay against the Black's position. 
The knight is misplaced as well. The queen comes into the open. And they are even, this is a very beautiful game. Uh, just basically follows the principles that if your opponent doesn't castle your king, your main job is to keep the king stuck in the center and open up lines of attack. I just show the game because of how beautiful it is. The knight falls very, very beautiful. And actually, in the end, white is the one who has more pawns. White is now up with two pawns. Uh, and with an attack still, check. It loses even more pawns. I mean, it's almost a mate. And it is a mate. GG. Very nice game. One more game and then we'll, we'll finish uh, on the lesson. And I'll get some points from you guys. Uh, okay. So now we are going to look at another example. This is played in the same tournament in the candidates of 1953. This is the game between Samuel Reshevsky uh, versus Yuri Aveba. Samuel Reshevsky is one of the most positional players to have played in chess history. So here he plays against Yuri Avebak. Now Avebak plays with the white pieces, with the black pieces, sorry. So we see again the opening that we saw in the first game, the Nimzo Indian. And as you can see from his style, the positional player doesn't really start by attacking right away. The positional player is more interested in completing development and getting their pieces to the right squares. And when the pieces are in the right squares and they have taken the right positions, then an attack will start. Look how everything is happening systematic, step by step. The pieces are being moved to the right squares. That's also a hallmark of a positional player or strategical player as well is getting the pieces to the right position. Uh, the opponent's king is castled on the same side as our king. What should be your plan? If you want to attack the opponent's king, if you castle on the same side, how should you go about this? So how should you go about this when the opponent castles on the same side that you have castled? How do you attack their king? Yeah, you guys are too quiet. For some people who want to participate in a group, listen, you need to be participating a bit more. Or you don't know all these questions I'm asking you, which is even more concerning for me if you don't know the answers. All right. Anyone with an idea? Okay, because because of time, I'm just going to say it because we we have two minutes left, but we won't really finish in two minutes. Maybe we'll go over time just a little bit. Um, so let me just explain. When you castle on the same side you should attack by bringing more pieces on the same side of the board because it will make no sense normally to push all these pawns in front of your king to attack the opponent's king because you leave your own king exposed to being attacked. So that's why Samuel Ryshevsky is bringing the pieces to that side. The more pieces you can bring there, especially if you can bring more pieces than the opponent can defend with, then you can really find a way to attack. And that's basically what happened. He brought enough pieces that side uh, and took the center. And slowly but surely improving the position. More pieces are coming to the king side and he maintains a strong connection in the center. Now notice why it is attacking with one, two, three, four, five, six pieces. Only the bishop is the one that's really not attacking on the other side. Uh, and that's basically 
what ended up happening. Uh, sorry, there's a very strange light reflecting on my, must be the light from outside. Uh, since our lesson is not really learning media games, we're just learning about the opening. I'm explaining the styles and showing you the examples, but the games I just showed the end for the sake of completion and how beautifully it is the opponent resigned here. Uh, they lost a queen and the opponent remains with an attack. There was a pin happening, knight check. There was, there is threats everywhere. He couldn't uh, ignore this because after this, what was white going to do? Um, capture with the rook to get a check, then check with the queen, then, then it's a checkmate. What was white going to do now? After King G8? Um, capture with the rook. Tiveka, are you still there? Okay. Yeah, capture the rook, correct. Captures the rook, king takes, check, and checkmate. So the king, uh, the opponent was forced to sacrifice their queen, and after takes, takes, it resigns. Because white will just take, oh wait, is, oh, it's check. King there, if you take here, they can just be take maybe, who knows, and just take. This is just losing. All right, so that, with that, that, that is our lesson on choosing the right opening for you. So before I let you guys go, I want to do an application time to apply what you have learned somehow. So let me find out from each one of you. Uh, please tell me at least three interesting things that you personally have gained from this lesson. We can start with uh, Tristan. Tristan, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Somehow um, your guys' speakers don't work anymore. I don't know whether it's me or... Okay. Okay, how can I hear them? Please help me find out how to hear them. Because can you, oh, there we go. Now I hear you there. I think it's, it seems it's fixed now. Yeah. Okay, Tristan, you can type it down, that's fine. Yeah, Mulueli, do you want to say your things? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah, it's fixed somehow. Oh, I think I just um, need to change the headset somewhere. Oh, okay, Um. so firstly, uh, I'll just say the other same thing that I said initially, which is that no opening wins on this game. I think that was at most the most important thing I learned because I, I used to have that idea that um there are just certain openings that lose and certain openings that win. So yeah, I used to go at it uh yeah about that way. But yeah, I guess that clearly showed that yeah, no openings actually do win or lose. And another interesting thing is um I was more of like a one one sided player. Like I would just play a single opening with white and a single opening with black. It's because I, it's what I was used to. But mm -hmm. yeah, now I think I'm going to go ahead and try the techniques you said, watch a few matches and check which openings excite me, try to find out what I like more, not just stick with one thing. So I think that's another thing that, that was really helpful. Mm -hmm. And also um, the hint of um, using uh, high, high, high class games like candidates and championship games to study my openings, like find games where my openings were played and try to study how the people are 
went ahead to play the variations and how different the matches can turn out. I think that will also be helpful in my practices. So yeah, that, I think that's just a few of the stuff that I can say at the moment from what I learned in this session. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so Tivek says, no opening wins or loses. Bring all your pieces to the same side where your opponent castled and watch games that are played in certain openings with top players. Okay, great, wonderful. And Tristan, what are your three things? I think you said you were typing them, so I'm not sure if you're still typing them. But yeah, otherwise, whilst Tristan is typing his list, I would just like to thank you all for taking time to join this uh, group lesson, and clearly you did learn some things. That's very good, but uh, for important, well, the most important thing, of course, is now what you do with the information. It's one thing to learn something. It's much more important to do what you have learned, to try and apply it somehow. And the best way is to apply it immediately so that you can remember it in your memory. So think of ways you can start to use the things you have learned after this lesson so that it can stick in your mind. And then it becomes something that you are already practicing and doing uh, consistently because that is the there are two main ways to improve your chess playing strength number one is to use what you know if you use what you know you become a stronger chess player that is a fact it is a fact written in stone if you use the stuff that you know about chess you become a stronger chess player the second thing to become a strong player is to decrease the mistakes that you are making if you reduce the amount of mistakes you are making, you also become a strong player. So those are the two things that I'll leave you with. Use what you know, you become a stronger player. Reduce your obvious mistakes and you become a stronger player. And as Tristan says, I learned that I should, I learned that I should learn my playing styles, games to... Okay, I'm not sure yeah, it's clear, Tristan. But I think you basically wanted to say you learned that you learn that you should learn your playing style and learn more about it uh, and better yourself. Okay, uh, those are good points. Uh, thank you uh, for that. And yeah, thanks all for the contribution and taking the time. Uh, and yeah, before I let you go, remember, as always, keep chasing. Bye-bye and have a good uh, Saturday afternoon. Thank you very much. Enjoy uh, your day too.